All right, I see it says we are recording. So first of all, I want to uh, say thank you to Dr. Lewis for joining us today. Um, Dr. Mark Lewis received his medical degree, completed his internal medicine residency and served as chief resident at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. After completing a hematology oncology fellowship at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, where he served as chief fellow, he returned to Houston to work at the MD Anderson Cancer Center for four years with a dual appointment in, in general and gastrointestinal medicine, medical oncology before assuming the directorship of gastrointestinal oncology at Intermountain Healthcare in 2016. He's on the board of directors of the Neuroendocrine Tumor Research Foundation, vice president of American Multiple Endocrine Neoplasia Support and co-chair of the communications committee for the North American Neuroendocrine Tumor Society and a neuroendocrine patient himself. Uh, so we are very thankful to have Dr. Lewis here today. And uh, Dr. Lewis, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Erin, for the, the warm welcome and for the invitation in the first place. And Barry, thanks for your comments earlier. Um, so I did mull over the possibility of presenting slides this morning, but you know, I am in academics and I've seen too much death by PowerPoint, just boring your audience with slide after slide, I thought maybe it would be nicer, especially on a Saturday morning and we're all friends here to have a conversation. And so I really want this to be a back and forth. Feel free to put questions in the chat or chime in if there's something that I say that's unclear. As I hopped on earlier, I could already um, hear a couple of issues we could discuss regarding management and surveillance. And you know, I will say we live in an amazing time for uh, patients with neuroendocrine tumors, the, the field both in terms of diagnostics and therapeutics looks completely different now than it did even a decade ago. And we can talk about the advances that have accrued since 2009 in particular. But what I really wanted to do was tell you a little bit about my origin story because as was already um, revealed, I'm, I'm a patient myself. Um, and as I'll tell you, I have a little bit of a pet theory that oncologists are slightly more likely than other doctors to have experienced cancer themselves because so many of us are drawn to the field um, through our families. Um, and family history as a very sort of weak relative risk factor does slightly increase your predisposition to cancer. Ergo, I find that a lot of oncologists actually, um, when you start digging into their uh, personal history to the extent that they'll let you, will have had some sort of brush uh, with cancer, whether in a parent or another loved one. And although we can come off sometimes as some very cold um, scientists sort of, you know, in, in white coats and studying statistics, um, I think you'll find actually at the core of a lot of oncologists, there's an emotional pull to the field. And that's really what um, keeps us going along with the fact that the science is just so gratifying and we are making progress. Maybe not quickly enough, but we are making progress. So maybe the first thing you should know about me is I'm not American. Uh, I'm Scottish. And the reason that's relevant is when you move to this country, you are required to get a chest x-ray. And this is a practice that long predates COVID. It's actually a public health measure against tuberculosis. And so we moved here from uh, Scotland uh, in 1987. And at the time I was a wee boy and uh, my mother was in good health and my father was 42 years old, also seemed in very good health. He was a university professor and a writer and seemed to be doing great. And then we got this call from the embassy and I, I know most of us on this um, Zoom may have had the experience of, of receiving bad news. And there's a real art to, uh, to breaking bad news, frankly, as an oncologist. It, it takes a lot of um, skill, it takes a lot of emotional nuance. So this is the example I give my trainees of how not to break bad news. So we got this just very officious phone call from the embassy telling us that it's kind of a good news, bad news situation. My father's chest x-ray didn't show TB, but it did show he had a mass occupying almost his entire right lung. And what that meant for us is, you know, American healthcare was completely new. Um, so in Scotland, we um, are part of the National Health Service, which has its pluses and minuses. But one of the things that you don't have to worry about is cost. Um, and then within two weeks um, of arriving in the States, my father had his entire right lung removed. That was $30,000 on credit cards, and money we didn't have. Um, and unfortunately, uh, that was an in six, or I should, should say incomplete and unsuccessful operation. So you should know there's ways we grade surgeries, and this is a little bit technical, but I think it's important to mention. So R0 means that the surgeon says, 
quote, we got it all. And then when you look at it under the microscope, the margins all the way around the tumor are clean, meaning uninvolved with cancer. Then there's an R1, which is sort of a nasty surprise when the surgeon thinks that they removed the entire tumor. But in the final analysis, it happens in the pathology lab, typically in the days after the operation. Unfortunately, there is residual tumor at, at the margin. And then finally, there's something called an R2 resection, which is when the surgeon themselves knows coming out of the operating room uh, that they were unsuccessful or unable to remove the entire tumor. And that was the case with my dad. So what had happened was the tumor that had started here in his chest actually involved a lot of organs in a space we call the, the mediastinum. And I heard some questions earlier about how you look at different organs. Um, this is a, a very, very um, tricky area to operate in to give due credit to the surgeon. As you can imagine, there's a lot of high value real estate here that behind your breastbone, you've got your heart, you've got the great vessels. Um, obviously your lung, your esophagus has to descend um, behind your heart. It, it's really, really a tricky area. And what had happened was the tumor that was in my dad's chest was so inextricably linked to those organs uh, that it could not be removed. Um, and, and I should point out at this point, they were told somewhat inexactly um, that this was a weird form of lung cancer. And my poor father, uh, I'll cut to the chase, he, he, he passed from his disease and I'll explain the course in a second, but he went to his grave thinking it was something he had done wrong. Um, he had no vices and to be very, very clear about lung cancer for a second, Lung cancer has suffered for, or patients with lung cancer have suffered for decades from stigma because everybody, doctors included, was linking smoking and lung cancer. And what we know now is about 15, 1-5% of patients with lung cancer are non-smokers. Our goal, not every smoker who gets lung cancer, uh, it necessarily the smoking was not necessarily the culprit. And, and frankly, no one should ever be blamed for um, for malignancy they, they develop. And I'm a big believer in that. Uh, partly because my dad, again, thought that, well, gosh, maybe it was secondhand smoke exposure. And he, he really, you know, mulled over, you know, what, what he could have done differently. And the answer, as we'll get to, is you couldn't have done anything differently. This was, this was in the genes. So, um, so let me jump back. So we had this unsuccessful operation. And then this was the late 80s. And we needed radiation to the residue in his chest. And I have such a vivid memory as, as his son, um, seeing him, he had his shirts off. They just drew a big red X. That was as um, sort of simple as the field got, and they just fired away. And again, as I mentioned, there's so much important organs in here that it really was very damaging to his esophagus. It made it very difficult for him to eat. He was a lecturer. It made it difficult for him to talk, and it had, it had a huge impact on his quality of life. And again, in fairness to the radiation doctors, they were doing the best they could at the time, but it was a pretty crude approach. And then most guttingly, um, that, even, even that measure uh, failed, to, failed to cure him uh, and the tumor cells spread from his chest to his, his bones. And that was extremely painful. And again, this was a man who um, grew up teetotal, never had an intoxicant, and all of a sudden he was requiring morphine uh, to control his pain, which for him was extremely um, difficult to accept. Um, and, and, and here again, stigma. Opioids were developed for patients with cancer pain. Uh, and I know we're in the midst of the opioid crisis and, and there's all sorts of people to blame for that, but the people that shouldn't be to blame are the patients. Um, because even, even my dad uh, in the early nineties struggled with, with needing opioids. And I see the same oh, um, okay. agony that my patients go through now, not to mention all the hoops they have to go through to even acquire the painkillers, but that's a separate tangent. And, and again, there are these moments that stick out in my mind. I, I remember coming into the living room and my father who had always been stone cold sober was sitting there and he asked me to, to mail a package for him. He was tying up a parcel. There was nothing there. It was just thin air. And uh, I remember thinking, gosh, my poor dad, you know, he's, this is, he's, he's literally losing his faculties right in front of my uh, eyes. So he passed in, uh, in 1994 after a pretty long battle uh, uh, and got a lot of chemo, actually died in the hospital uh, from an anaphylactic reaction to a chemotherapy agent called paclitaxel, which we still use today uh, in the management of lung and prostate and breast cancer. Um, paclitaxel is an interesting drug. Some of my patients come to me and they say, you know, I want all natural treatment. And you've got to be careful what you wish for, because actually there's quite a few potent chemotherapy drugs come straight from nature. Um, there's a, a drug called adriamycin, uh, which is pretty commonly used in breast cancer. That comes from the Adriatic Sea. And then paclitaxel comes from the bark of the Pacific yew tree. 
And the reason that's relevant is at the time it was so profoundly allergenic. It was, you know, no one's going around injecting tree bark. Um, and so it was uh, very unfortunate for my dad that he was getting paclitaxel at the time uh, when they just didn't understand how um, allergy provoking it was. And so he died of anaphylaxis, which is a horrible way to go. So that was 1994, I was a freshman in high school. I already knew I was interested in science. And as I mentioned earlier, so much of oncology is about pairing your head and your heart. And so this was my drive then to sort of <laughs> seek vengeance. You know, uh, I was, uh, Again, adolescent, I had some angst as a teenager, and then I'd see my dad die and I really hated cancer at that point, still do. So um, the, the happier part of the story is that my dad's oncologist, and I think he probably felt really guilty about how my dad passed actually, but he took me under his wing and offered me a job in his clinic every summer in high school and college. And so I started at the bottom and started as a medical assistant. I was taking vital signs and putting people in rooms and making sure they had clean gowns and that sort of thing. Then I was an x-ray technician for a while. And then the most important thing I got to do was just follow the doctor around, like we call it shadowing. And one of the beautiful things about medicine that some people don't think about is we're almost like a medieval guild. We, we have apprenticeship and, and even our, our formal training is essentially a series of hierarchies where you know, the student learns from the resident, the resident learns from the fellow, the fellow learns from the attending, the professor at the top. And in its best incarnation, you're passing down lessons to the people that are coming behind you from the people that have gone ahead of you. And it really is a, um, a pretty remarkable process, actually. And I'm, I'm very privileged to be part of that profession. But with the shadowing that happened with my dad's daughter, of course, it's quite informal. And I'll, I'll throw back here. Many of you will remember that it used to be the case when you went to the doctor's office that behind the receptionist's desk, there was just a big wall of color-coded charts. Uh, and now, of course, most... Uh, medical records have migrated to the computer for better or for worse. But my dad's oncologist had paper charts. And the reason that's relevant is he would actually use the margins of his notes to jot down like little details about the people. And I just thought it was such a beautiful expression that you know, these were not just hosts of tumors to him. They were actual individuals that he was learning about and caring for. And so it would be things like, you know, their um, grandson's you know soccer tournament was coming up or some big college sports thing was happening and he would mention them and it and again didn't have to take up a whole lot of time in the visit but it was profoundly humanizing and I, I heard someone earlier saying well maybe I need to find a new oncologist and um you know not every oncologist does have a fantastic bedside manner and you can argue about how much that matters but I know that when I was in medical school and I'd already committed emotionally to being an oncologist they taught us that short of psychiatry Oncology allows you to have the closest relationship with your patient. And I mean that in the most appropriate professional way. It's not friendship per se. Uh, there's always going to be a power imbalance in medicine. Um, but you do, you really do develop a kinship. And the, and the thing I love about taking care of neuroendocrine patients is I, I typically get to do that for years. There are certainly very aggressive phenotypes of nets, like my dad's cancer. Uh, but for the most part, most of us, thankfully, uh, are hopefully managing this as sort of more a chronic illness uh, over the course of years and that allows us to foster relationships um, between patients and doctors again in, in the best version of care so anyway that really convinced me i'm following my dad's oncologist friend convinced me this is what i what i wanted to do so fast forward so as i mentioned there's a there's a process you go through so i did four years of medical school i did three years of residency i was a chief resident for one year and then i started my fellowship so that's when you actually sub specialize in oncology on my very first day as a you know, freshly minted oncologist, I had terrible abdominal pain. And to be honest with you, you know, self-diagnosis is a tricky thing. I, I thought it might be appendicitis. It was kind of down in my right lower quadrant. Many of you on this call will have experienced abdominal symptoms and tried to interpret them. It could be kind of tricky. But actually what was happening was my calcium level, my blood calcium was high. And I've often described it like this. You know, when you look at the stars, they can look like a thousand points of light, but if you if you see the right pattern, all of a sudden you've picked out a constellation, right? Like Orion's belt. And that's what it was like for me. I've had all these facts about my dad in my head for years and years. At that point, I'd gone through about eight years of formal training. And finally, I had the piece of information I needed to see that pattern because I knew there's only two conditions in which you would have consecutive generations with high calcium levels. One of them is completely benign. It's called familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia. It means you don't put enough calcium in your urine, so it builds up in your bloodstream. I got checked for that. That wasn't it. So that left one answer. And uh, I'll quote Sherlock Holmes here, which is, if you've eliminated every possibility, uh, 
whatever is left, um, no matter how unlikely, must, must be the truth. And so my condition is called multiple endocrine neoplasia type one. Uh, and it has a host of, of features, but the one that is actually shared by everybody with this condition is sooner or later you will develop high calcium. It's because the, the parathyroid glands, the tiny little pea-sized glands that live behind your thyroid, <clears throat> they regulate your calcium level and they all get switched on and become overactive. And so calcium starts moving at a faster pace than it ought to from your bones into your circulation. And um, that's a couple of things, one of which is it weakens your bones. So 98% of our calcium at any given time is supposed to be in our bones and give our skeleton structure. And it's, it's a good thing that it does, otherwise we'd be puddles on the floor. But if you leach out the calcium too quickly, you develop osteoporosis. And that's exactly what was going on with me. So at 30 years old, I had osteoporosis, my calcium in my blood was high, and that was slowing down my intestines and giving me a condition called ileus, which some of you might have experienced. I know some people on this call probably had frank small bowel obstruction from their mid-gut tumors, but ileus is just shy of that. It's not a structural blockage. It's a functional problem where things aren't moving fast. Um, the bowels get very distended with gas. It's very uncomfortable. And that was the pain that I was having. So I was at Mayo Clinic. I went to the doctor I'd been assigned again, first week of my fellowship. I said, hey, I'm a new oncology fellow here. I think I have a hereditary tumor syndrome. And this is something I think will resonate with you guys is that he didn't believe me. Um, and, you know, I, I came with a lot of facts. I came with what I thought was a, a pretty ironclad medical argument, but he thought I was a hypochondriac. Um, and it was only, and I'm almost ashamed to admit this, it was only because I could exert some leverage, some professional courtesy, if you will, that I was able to get the tests that I requested. I, I think if I had been quote, a regular patient, I think I might've been turned away. And then I've probably had to deal with this for months or years before getting the right answer. Regardless, I was proven right. I had genetic testing. It showed that I had the mutation. And uh, that, of course, has been the lens to which I've seen the rest of my career. Um, so I've had a couple of surgeries at this point. Um, I had my, the first thing I did was have my parathyroids removed. And it was amazing because as soon as my calcium normalized, I felt so much better. And I realized that for years, my high calcium had been slowing me down and been giving me symptoms like pain probably been interfering with my sleep. I thought all these things were, were symptoms of residency. You know, when you're a resident, you work crazy hours, you have horrible eating habits. Um, and so, you know, here I am being trained to be a diagnostician. I missed it in, my, in myself. Um, and then I, in 2017, I had a Whipple procedure to remove um, neuroendocrine tumors from the head of my pancreas. And I saw a question earlier asking, well, why, why the gap? Why did eight years elapse between the discovery of these tumors and the removal of at least some of them. So I'll speak to that. Um, so because I'm genetically a mutant, right? So every cell in my body is, is programmed to, to kind of go wrong in terms of the MEM1 gene. Um, and it's something called the two hit hypothesis. So I was born missing one copy of MEM1 uh, or, uh, from my dad. And, and my mo mother's copy was intact. However, as I go through life, uh, the allele I got from my mother is going to be prone to <clears throat> errors, and that's where the, the tumors can come from. So it, my entire pancreas is always going to be abnormal, is my point. And when I first was looking at my pancreas, I realized I had a host of options. So this was 2009, and as I mentioned earlier, the diagnostics in the field have come such a long way. So at the time, I had a couple of options. I had CT scan, I had MRI, <clears throat> I had Octrio scan, which was, uh, again, something many of you may have had, a precursor to the modern day gallium and, and copper, but the same idea using the isotope indium. And then finally, I had endoscopic ultrasound, which is obviously the most invasive of the approaches, but actually allows you, it turns out, to get the best possible pictures of your pancreas. And I know that because that was my research topic when I was a fellow at Mayo. So when you're a fellow in most oncology programs, um, you're given typically six months, sometimes longer, to do research. And very selfishly, I went to my boss, my fellowship director, and I said, I would like to research how best to manage the MEN1 pancreas. And he sort of gave me a wry smile because it was obvious why I wanted to do this. But funnily enough, no one at Mayo had really um, studied this systematically. And I got three different opinions on what to do. One opinion was, just watch your pancreas. You don't have to do anything right now. The other was, have a Whipple right then in 2009. And the final option, which is clearly the most extreme, was just remove the entire pancreas, you know, just, just that easy, just have a total pancreatectomy. And at the time, and it's different now, 
uh, it was estimated that a total pancreatectomy would take 11 years off your lifespan because you would immediately develop what we call brittle diabetes, where you have neither insulin nor the counter-regulatory hormone glucagon. So you're, you're kind of stuck because your blood sugar is going to go all over the place and you're going to experience high highs and very low lows. Um, and, and thankfully, in the interim, we've gone, gone a long way in diabetes management, as many of you may know, with continuous glucose monitoring and insulin pumps. But again, at the time, that seemed like a pretty drastic option to me, and I figured it was going to end my career right as it was getting started. So, so I opted for observation, and here's why. So I was able, very, very lucky, actually, to get the records of every single patient at the Mayo Clinic ever who had had surgery on their pancreas for an endocrine tumors. And the one, well, there's many beautiful things about Mayo. One beautiful thing is they've held on to their records since the funding of the clinic in the 1910s, I think, by the Mayo brothers. And so I got to go to this archive. It was very old school. Talk about old medical records. I would literally like open these things up and dust would come out. And so I was able to follow kind of over the years, over the decades, over a century actually, um, how imaging had informed decisions to take people to surgery. Now, of course, prior to the 1970s, we didn't even have CT scans. So the only way you could quote see inside someone was either a plain x-ray uh, or just opening them up, something we call exploratory laparotomy. So Everything up until the 1970s, frankly, was um, almost moot. Um, but from then on, things got really interesting because I got to see the evolution of the imaging. And again, I think this will be germane to discussion about scans, um, because scans, again, have come a long way. So what I found was this. Um, CT scans, uh, the delivery of the contrast, the timing at which the iodine went into someone's arm mattered so much in whether you could see the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors or not. And that remains true to this day. MRI was better than CT. And then what trumped them all was endoscopic ultrasound. I'll get to our tree scan in a second. But endoscopic ultrasound was the best because the gastroenterologist, it's really remarkable what they do. They have to do two extra years of training just to be able to do this called complex endoscopy. So not only are they putting a camera down your throat, which then advances through your stomach and into your small intestine. So it's then millimeters away from your pancreas. They're doing real time radiology because on the end of that scope is an ultrasound probe. The ultrasound probe is broadcasting images onto a screen that the gastroenterologist is looking at. And then they have to decide, well, do I wanna be putting needles in there? And even if they don't do a biopsy, it turns out you get the best crispest pictures of the pancreas uh, by doing endoscopic ultrasound. And the other beauty of it is obviously it's invasive, but it carries absolutely no radiation. Because if your patient's like us and you're gonna need scans again and again and again, you really wanna be pretty thoughtful actually about how much radiation you're incurring in that process. And I'll point out too that uh, MRI carries no radiation. It's just a big noisy magnet. And actually most of the modern day PET CTs like copper and dotate, depending on how they're done, actually carry less radiation than just doing a full body CT scan, which is which actually quite a lot of x-rays. So I was, I was very fortunate actually. So I got to write this paper up about endoscopic ultrasound one point, Mayo sent me to Japan to present it. And I was like, my life is amazing. I can't believe I'm getting to do this. Um, and then most importantly, it affected my own management. So I'm finally going to answer the question that was put in the chat. So I did endoscopic ultrasound every year from 2009 until 2017. And what was happening was I was able to measure, from scan to scan, millimeter scale growth uh, in the neuroendocrine tumors in, in, in my pancreas. And I, I always had the biggest one in the head of the pancreas. Um, I really only knew it was there because of occasional pain. <clears throat> you may know the pancreas really does two things. So everyone knows, as we mentioned earlier, it has endocrine function. So it makes hormone, but it also has exocrine with an X function. And that means it makes digestive enzymes that it puts into the gut. So many of us with peanuts will experience from time to time either bouts of mild pancreatitis, which is profoundly uncomfortable, or we'll have some digestive issues because those enzymes aren't quite making it to where they're supposed to go which makes it hard for us to digest fat and, uh, and high protein load. Anyway, so I, I watched year by year, and then I saw in 2017, one of the tumors jump in size, essentially double in size. And um, so there's a couple sort of hints on, on scan that a tumor needs to be removed, uh, one of which is its size, and the other is its growth rate, it's the tempo of its growth. And so I knew that basically a, a switch had flipped in that particular tumor and it needed to be removed or it was going to metastasize to my liver. And the reason I knew that is I'll flip back to Europe. The Dutch have done such a phenomenal job with their MEN1 patients. They have a national health record 
and they have meticulously documented what has happened with every single patient in their country with MEN1. And what they've learned is when a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, when it starts to get over two centimeters, but certainly when it gets over three, and we love the, the metric system in medicine, so that's a little bit over an inch once you're at three centimeters, um, then the risk of it spreading is dramatically higher than if it's below that size threshold. So I know it sounds weird that we would put so much stock into millimeter scale changes, but that's the way it goes. So based on that data, and uh, based on the, the growth rate I was seeing as an oncologist, it was weird to sort of weigh it in my own case. It's hard to have impartiality when you're staring at your own whipple, but my surgeon here uh, really said, you know, Mark, I think it's time this comes out. And so that's why I have my whipple. Uh, it's not an easy surgery. Many of you may have had it, uh, but I think it was a life-saving surgery. And in fact, just as recently as this week, I had my annual scans and it shows that the rest of my pancreas actually looks pretty good, all things considered, and my liver is still clean. And I realize I may sound like I'm gloating and I'm really not trying to do that. Um, having a sporadic neuroendocrine tumor, I actually suspect you're more likely to be found to have liver metastasis um, because unlike me, you may not have had the sort of foresight that you had a, a condition uh, and, and you may not have been as lucky as me to be able to monitor it and kind of see things coming in. So for that, I apologize. I will say though, the surgery itself gave me a lot of empathy for my patients. I have not yet had chemo. I've not yet had analog and I can explain why not. Um, but I understand, you know, looking at a, a life saving slash life changing operation. And I also understand the chronic illness paradigm whereby many of us, unfortunately, at least with modern medicine are not going to be cured of this disease. Um, and that's, um, that's tough. And a lot of times when people come to me, they're expecting cure. And I have to be very honest at our very first visit um, that, most of my patients are not curable. <clears throat> and that goes for my entire practice. But one wonderful thing that's happened is by being so <laughs> demonstrative or even exhibitionist about my net condition, my practice has become a, a feedback loop where the more net patients I see, um, the more groups like yours I talk to, the more net patients come to my practice. And so I, I'd estimate now, I mean, most of my practice is colon and traditional pancreas cancer or adenocarcinoma, but probably about one in four of my patients have nets. Um, and so it's a, it's a beautiful niche to work in. I, I learn from my patients every day. Uh, it's a lovely exchange. Almost all of them know I have, have nets. And it's not because I tell them, I actually almost never self-disclose. It's because they got to me knowing that I have nets and assuming that on some level, I get it. And, and maybe I do, maybe I don't. I don't have carcinoid syndrome. As I mentioned, I haven't yet started some statin analog, uh, but I have benefited um, from all the advances in the field over the last decade and hopefully contributed a tiny bit to that at least in terms of how to manage ME in one patients. So I've spoken for a while now um, and I see a couple of things popping up in the chat. So why don't maybe Aaron might, why don't I pause and happy to address what's in the chat or, or take questions from your group. Um, hi, Dr. Lewis, it's Sally. I'm the moderator hey. today. Hey, Sally. Um, hi, uh, nice to meet you. Um, we had a couple of questions come in through our email box that I put in the chat. Yes. Uh, but the one question you kind of were just talking about it is how can we be sure lanreotide is the right treatment and who is it not appropriate for? Yeah. Well, I'll say two things there. Um, <clears throat> one of which is why I'm not on analog. Well, let me actually start by addressing lanreotide though. So I, I kept referencing 2009 as sort of a pivotal year in net management. And that was the year that I think that Sandestat and LAR uh, really came of age. And one thing you should know, and I learned this when I was at Mayo, is Sandestat and analogs were sort of born at Mayo Clinic. So in the 80s, uh, in particular, there was this titan of GI oncology called Charles Mortel. And um, among other things, he actually decided the criteria by which we judge on scan whether a tumor is growing or shrinking. And that sounds so silly and, and intuitive, but it was really not. Um, and I'll just, as a brief aside, explain to you what he did, because it still affects how we interpret scans today. So remember, in the 1970s, CTs were coming online, and uh, people were still kind of figuring out how, how do we use them. And what Dr. Martel wanted to know was, what was a change in tumor size that we would consider clinically meaningful? And I bring this up because I see a lot of my net patients, and I love it, sort of be wonderful um, sort of stewards of their own data and track things over time with just absolutely meticulous detail. And, and sometimes I actually wonder uh, if, if it's not um, a source of tremendous anxiety when things change on scan by a millimeter or so. And, and frankly, that might be within the margin of error of the scan because this is what Dr. Martel did. 
he brought in a group of 16 surgeons. And what he had done was he'd put small brass spheres under a rubber mat, and they were all slightly different sizes. And what he was interested in was these surgeons who, of course, had incredible manual dexterity, and incredible feel with their hands. He wanted to know at what cut point would they be able to tell the difference between one sphere and the other? And the reason I'm bringing this up, this is still to this day, how when we're doing clinical trials, we judge whether something has grown on scan. And I, I, it's such a remarkable story. I can't believe now that nearly five decades later, four decades later, this is still the way we do it, but regardless. So what he found was surgeons could actually feel or detect a difference in size of about 20 to 30%. So a relative change in size of 20 to 30%, whether it was growing or shrinking. And that remains what we call the resist criteria, excuse me, the resist criteria, the radiologic evaluation criteria in solid tumors, it's an acronym. And a lot of people actually don't think it's that applicable to neuroendocrine tumors because neuroendocrine tumors can stay exactly the same size, exactly the same circumference or diameter, but they can actually die on the inside. They're so profoundly vascular that they are very, very prone to having their blood supply disrupted. And so I actually, when you actually sit down and look at the scan, one thing I do in my practice that I'm proud of is I show my patients their pictures. It is one thing to read the text, which is sometimes you know totally marred in jargon. It's completely another to see a scan. And so I really try to carve out time in clinic um, when I'm, I'm following up. I, I tell the patient, I call it the fork in the road appointment, not with any sort of you know sinister intent, but to tell them, you know, if we're making a decision on management, we really want to spend the time and I want them to understand their own body. And the other thing that's beautiful about doing that is then they can sort of map the images they've seen on the screen to how they interpret their own symptoms, particularly in regards to say the abdomen. Um, anyway, so my, long story short, um, so we've come a long way from CT, which just measures size. I mean, CT is just a stack of x-rays. As I mentioned earlier, traditional CT scan is probably something like 200 x-rays and the slice thickness determines how uh, closely together or far apart those slices are. And a typical CT scan slices are probably about three millimeters apart. So not, not perfect. And that again introduces margin of error. Now in the modern day, um, so, so I'm gonna jump back to sense that in a minute, but the modern day with, with gallium and copper dotate PET CT, which I heard mentioned as I was jumping on the call, that's a functional imaging. So what you're doing there is you're putting in a radioactive isotope and copper 64 is the, the new kind of gold standard for reasons I can explain. And you're asking yourself, where is that gonna go in the body? Now, it's really important to understand, especially if you're reading your reports or looking at your pictures, it will normally go to certain places. So gallium and copper will normally bind the adotatate to the pituitary gland. So if you're looking at your scan, you see a bright spot right between your eyes, that's your pituitary. It will always go there. It usually goes a little bit to the salivary glands. <clears throat> it will go to the spleen. In fact, the spleen is often the brightest thing on a gallium or a copper because the spleen's job is to take things out of circulation. That's what the spleen thinks it's ought to, ought to be doing and, and it's a filter. So it will take out the isotope actually really, really quickly and very, very avidly. The liver, alarmingly enough for some patients will have a little bit of background uh, uptake. And then this is really crucial actually, and I'm, I'm, I'm definitely gonna drive this point home. There's a part of the pancreas called the uncinate process. So if you've got the, the head of the pancreas here, the body and the tail, there's a little part here called the uncinate and it is jam packed as it turns out with somatostatin receptors. And so there's always gonna be a sort of a glimmer, um, a bright spot in the uncinate. And the reason that's important is we started doing gallium scans at my place in 2017 in Intermountain, largely because I asked, asked them to get the scanner because I thought our trio scan was so terrible. Um, and the radiologists were calling me in a panic. The first, I think, five or 10 scans we did, they said, Mark, oh my gosh, we're finding pancreatic tumors. And then we realized, because um, we would follow up to the endoscopic ultrasound and there's nothing there. Um, and then we realized it's always happening in the same spot. And sure enough, the National Institutes of Health, the NIH, was just publishing a paper saying, you've got to be careful there's always false positive uptake in the uncinate process. So I'll just say that. And then finally, to be a little bit blunt, the isotope has to leave your body. And it does so through your kidneys, your ureters, the tubes that go down into the bladder and then out of the bladder. So those are always gonna be bright spots as well. And so the, the story of the semastan analogs, I think has to be told in parallel with imaging. Because you were asking uh, there, Sally, who's appropriate? So if you do it, 
copper or a gallium skin, and again, these days, hopefully copper, copper is more stable than gallium. Gallium, once it comes off the generator, only lasts about 68 minutes. So I, I tell my patients, it's like trying to manage ice cream in the summertime. It's basically melting right in front of you, and you've got to give it to the patient before it decays. And actually, we had a couple uh, experiences here in Utah, which is a big state, where we would try to transport the gallium, and we were kind of pushing our luck, because if there was even bad traffic, um, the, the gallium would decay before it got to the patient at some outlying hospital. And the reason I, I knew that is when I looked at their scans, there was no uptake anywhere, no, nowhere, not even the pituitary. And that told me well, that, was a, that was actually a false negative scan, so we're gonna have to do that one again, regardless. So if you do these scans and they bind to abnormal sites of uptake, particularly you know, bright spots in, in the liver or in the bones, it's profoundly sensitive for bone metastasis, then you know, it's kind of the lock and key hypothesis, then you know that the lock is there for treatment. And the key, among other things, is somatostatin analogs. It also means you're a candidate for PRT down the road. We can talk about that too. So to answer your question, Sally, I, I think that um, anyone with a positive gallium or um, copper Dota tape PET CT, copper being the modern standard as of uh, end of 2020, um, is then a candidate in my mind for analog. <clears throat> um, now, I mentioned 2009. So what happened in 2009 was there was a trial came out called PROMID and it took a relatively small number of patients and showed that if you put them on sandostatin, uh, you were more likely to stabilize their tumors than if you had them just on observation. Uh, and there's a lot of sort of quibbles with the study. Again, the numbers were not particularly uh, large. They only enrolled people with growth rates of 2% or under. And I don't know about your group, but other support groups I've talking to, to, uh, spoken to, excuse me, um, many patients are aware of their KI67, the growth rate of your tumor. And you can only know that from pathology. So either a biopsy or a surgery, they then have to lay down a chemical, almost like a marinade. And it brings out that at that moment in time, how many of the neuroendocrine tumor cells were dividing? The nice, nice answer is our, our tumors tend to grow fairly slowly. Um, someone like my dad, however, I mean, you're talking growth rates above 55%, but many of us um, thankfully have growth rates that are, are pretty slow. And so PROMIT was interesting because it really kind of cherry picked the slowest of the slow and then showed that if you put them on sanostatin, you can suppress that growth even more. The problem with sandostat, and many of you have probably received it or maybe are receiving it, is you have to get the needle into muscle. Uh, it works only as an intramuscular depot. And of course, there's you know, the, the glutes, right? So that seems like a big target. You'd be surprised, though, even at academic centers of excellence like MD Anderson, there's a pretty shocking rate of not being able to get the needle all the way into muscle. And if you get sandostatin into fat, into subcutaneous tissue, it's just not gonna work as well. That month's uh, supply, if you will, which comes at enormous expense, not to mention discomfort, is not gonna work as well, if at all, if it doesn't get into muscle. So I think in 20, from 2014 on, um, and specifically in my, in my female patients, for reasons I'll explain, I almost exclusively at least start with, with lanreotide or sematulin because somatulin is much, much easier for the nurses to give. Most neuroendocrine patients feel like it's easier to receive. And then you don't have this worry about, did I actually get a shot to the tissue it needed to get to? And I did a, a study at MD Anderson with my mentor there, Dr. Yao, where we looked at women getting sandostatin injections and 60% of them, 60, 60 at MD Anderson, a center with a tremendous amount of expertise and experience in any cancer you care to mention, we're not getting sandostatin to the muscle. And you know, it's really kind of a depth issue that you know, men and women are different. And I'm not saying anything sexist, this is just anatomy. The muscle to fat ratio in women is different than in men. And it's harder for a woman to get an effective sandostatin injection. And I, I stand by that 100% in my practice. And you can ask any of my patients, I, I tell them this all the time and my nurses know this too. Um, what happened in 2014 was a trial came out called Clarinet. And Clarinet was a lanreotide study set up very similar to PROMID for Sandestad. But Clarinet allowed patients with growth rates of up to 10% to be enrolled, which is a more inclusive criterion and encompasses more real-world practice. And Clarinet, frankly, in my mind, kind of blows PROMID out of the water 
Um, it's very seductive for an oncologist to do what's called cross-trial comparison. And the tricky part here is I can't really do that with proven clarinet. There is never going to be a head-to-head -head study. There is zero incentive for either Novartis or Ibsen to do that. Um, so that, that's just not, not in the cards. I, I cannot foresee it's ever going to happen. However, we can extrapolate a couple things from clarinet. Uh, again, clarinet tells us that people that are started on lanamiotide with growth rates up to fivefold that of the proton population can get many, many years of what's called progression-free survival. So that's an on oncologic metric saying that you haven't had any growth and you're alive, um, which is a pretty wonderful endpoint in my mind. And they updated clarinet recently. Um, uh, the sort of ana analysis, you know, five years out, and they showed a couple things. Number one is patients that started on sandistatin and crossed over to lanreotide on average got about three years of durable disease control after switching, which is really pretty striking. And then patients with mid gut tumors who are started off the bat on uh, lanreotide um, typically got five years of disease control. Now, I know your audience is probably thinking, but these numbers, these don't have to be a self-fulfilling prophecy for anybody. Uh, and I'll point out, those are median numbers. Those are literally middle of the road. So half the patients are going to be on one side of that number and half are on the other. Um, very few are going to be right on that line. But it certainly convinced me that I think uh, lanreotide is a better drug than um, sandistatin, or at least a drug that works longer uh, for more patients and certainly for women. And the reason I haven't gotten it yet is, again, you got to remember, I'm a germline mutant. My tumors are driven by something deep in my genes, which is different than the biology of a sporadic neuroendocrine tumor patient, which I suspect as many of you. Um, so what's interesting is the gene that's gone wrong with me, the MEN1 gene, is clearly a problem. It's giving me lots of issues, but it actually predicts for a more indolent biology, even off analog. Remember, I, I was diagnosed in 2009. I've never gotten one injection, and for the most part, my tumors have behaved themselves. It's not always been easy, as I said, but I know I'm fortunate. I currently do not require analog for disease control. If I saw tumors growing in my pancreas, analog is probably the first thing that I would do. And even as a man, I'd probably go on lanreotide before I would go on sinistatin. And then what happens is if you, if you grow on analog, then in the modern era, you're a candidate for PRT. And I suspect we could have a whole separate conversation about that. Maybe some of you have had it. Um, but that's basically, again, exploiting the receptor, except now instead of putting in a diagnostic isotope into that pocket, like gallium or copper, you're putting in a therapeutic isotope, which in the modern era, in the US at least, is lutetium. Um, and there's been a lot of sort of debate about when to do a PRT. In fact, there's um, something happening today called the Great Debates in GI Oncology. And I think actually right now, there's a debate about when someone grows an analog, should you put them on PRT or should you put them on something else? And I think almost all of us would say at the moment, uh, PRT. So let me just check the chat box here. Sally, make sure I'm addressing questions. Yeah. Um, let's see here. What scans do you recommend to determine the rest of the body? Ileal net. Yeah. So, um, so Sarah Beth, I think I heard you actually po pose this question in the conversation before I joined. Um, I personally think in the modern era, you can't do better than copper 64 dotatate. As I think I heard you say, if, you're, if your doctor won't order that for you, you might want to seek a second opinion. On second opinions, uh, one of my things I evangelize is second opinions, especially in nets, are totally fine and perhaps strongly recommended uh, because there's a lot of um, oncologists. Let, let me back up and say, when I was MD Anderson, I had to see every cancer and then I had to specialize in GI oncology. And it is actually extremely difficult to maintain both breadth and depth. And I'm very lucky in my current job that I only see GI cancer. And like I said, one of four patients looks like me. They're a net patient, which is really kind of wonderful. And, and I feel kind of selfish if I'm very honest. But what I'm getting at is in community practice, and this is not like pity the doctor, but you've got to realize most oncologists will see a handful of neuroendocrine patients a year. And thus, it's not really reasonable to expect them to be completely on top of net management in the same way that say I'm invested, I mean, in the most selfish of reasons, you know, I keep up with the field, uh, but I hope that that's a benefit to my patients too. So you know, what I'm getting at is your doctor actually, uh, I'm not trying to be condescending, may not even know about copper 64 uh, Dota Tate PET because at least in my institution, we only got it in December and that's a relatively recent um, finding. So just to be clear, 
a typical Dota Tate PET CT is going to look usually from the vertex of your skull, at least from the skull base, capture the pituitary, all the way down to about mid thigh. There's really no reason to go beyond that. Um, and the reason for that, and I'm going to jump to the bone mat question in a second, is that gives us a very nice survey of everything we're interested in. So we see the pituitary glands, we see most of your bones. And remember that when tumors, and this is applicable to almost any cancer, when tumors spread to the bone, where they're actually going is the marrow, the bone marrow, because they get there via the bloodstream, right? They don't just, just grow by direct extension into the adjacent skeleton. They're getting there through your blood. And the blood and the marrow, of course, are, uh, there's an interface there because the marrow is what's making the blood cells, right? But the opposite can happen. So you can have ingress into the marrow from the bloodstream for metastatic cells in circulation. Now, here's what's interesting then about bone meds. Most neuroendocrine bone metastasis is asymptomatic. Um, I've actually had the pretty nasty experience. I'd say probably about one in three of the PET scans I've been doing since 2017, I've found bone metastasis that wasn't previously, previously visible. And it's a very, very tricky thing as a patient to know you've got bone mets even if you're not feeling them, I think there's a psychological aspect there. Um, so I've been, I've been pretty careful to caution people that have never had a PET scan before that, listen, um, I don't know exactly what we're gonna find. And I, I tell them it's like turning on the light. We've gotta be prepared to see uh, what we find. And, and um, here's an analogy, it might not resonate with the DC audience, but I'll, I'll say it anyway. So MD Anderson's in Houston. Houston is, it's actually a great, a great city, but it's a little bit uh, built in a swamp and there's a lot of cockroaches there. So sometimes what would happen is I would go into my kitchen in the middle of the night, flip on a light and I would see a cockroach. And if you see one cockroach, you know there's more. And it was then hard actually to kind of go back to bed and go to sleep because I knew that there was this thing running around. And that's, just, that's, what, that's my analogy with, with pets, particularly in regard to bone metastasis. You have to be prepared for what you're gonna see when you turn on the light because it may be completely asymptomatic. But now if it is bothering you psychologically, it's a problem. Now, Nan, I will say there are some people who do have symptomatic bone metastasis. It's seldom all of them. Um, so meaning if you have one bone metastasis, you probably have metastases, you probably have multiple. Um, we generally reserve radiation, meaning external beam radiation for symptomatic bone metastasis. And if some of my patients are really having a hard time or I think they're risk at, uh, are at risk for fracture, I'll put them on a, a drug I've stolen from the osteoporosis space, which is called venosumab. Um, and it's very benign. It's generally given in concert with the somatostatin analog. Uh, it only has to be given every three months as opposed to every 28 days. Um, and so it generally falls in, in a sort of a nice synchronization with the injection schedule for the somatostatin analog. So I hope I've addressed that. Um, let's see here. Sherry, immunotherapies. Oh, yeah, immunotherapy in NETS is a really interesting space. Um, we had a, a signal from a trial called DART, which stands for Dual Antibody Therapy in Rare Tumors. And if I can just um, be proud here for a second, my medical student, when I was a chief resident at Baylor, has gone on to be an absolute giant in the field of uh, immunotherapy. His name is Sandeep Patel. He practices at the University of California in San Diego. And Sandeep's awesome and is, talk about the people eclipsing the teacher. He's far more um, good at research than, than I am. But anyway, um, so he had this trial called DART. And what he said was, listen, there's all these rare tumors, including nets, um, where uh, it's, it's, it's important that we give these folks a chance for immunotherapy to see if it works because their individual numbers are never gonna be large enough that we're gonna be able to do a massive, massive study. So he did, he did what's called a basket trial, um, where uh, he basically had all these different cohorts and nets were one of them. So here's what was interesting is he did not see a signal for immunotherapy working in, in low grade neuroendocrine tumors, typically the tumors that you would be controlling with analog. He did see a signal that this can work in neuroendocrine carcinoma. So these are the growth rates that are above 20%. Um, and that's been hotly debated about whether or not we can rest our laurels on that trial, because again, the numbers are not very big. That is, I think, the, the best signal I've seen that immunotherapy can work. But it's a double-edged sword, because for it to work, it seems like you need a faster growth rate. And that's not something any of us want. So it's kind of sort of be careful what you wish for there. Um, so, and then, and then trials... Um, we can talk about maybe at the end, but yeah, there, there's a lot of promising things coming along. I actually think um, figuring out how best to use PRRT is probably the next 
best research area. Because if you think about it now, what we do is we bring you in and we give you a flat dose, meaning that every single person gets exactly the same amount of radioactive isotope. And that's unlike most of medicine. Most of medicine, at least in oncology, and certainly with chemo, most of the time we're adjusting the dose to you. Uh, based on characteristics like height and weight, sometimes kidney and liver function, PRT to date has not been like that. So there's a lot of really interesting work looking at dosimetry, meaning does every single person really need 200 milliquiries of lutetium times four? The answer is probably no. And the Europeans are decades ahead of us on PRT. So one place I think we're going is different isotopes. So PRT is an umbrella term. PRT doesn't just have to be lutetium or lutethera. It can be any radioisotope that you're giving that's going to bind to your receptor. And so there's all kinds of exciting um, isotopes coming along like actinium and terbium. And what's exciting about them is they seem to have more potent radiation dose to the tumor and less collateral damage to us. And that's important because the scariest thing about PRT, I think, is uh, maybe about 3% of folks, we think, end up with really serious bone marrow damage um, to the point they need transfusions or they might even develop leukemia. And, and that's an oncologist's worst nightmare, frankly, is to be managing a condition like neuroendocrine tumors where you think the prognosis overall is pretty good and then develop a life-threatening complication through treatment. Because um, these leukemias are really, really nasty. They're actually even worse than the leukemia is kind of came out of the blue. So, um, so now when I was addressing treatment for bone meds, when I was mentioning that shot, denosumab, that is uh, the same thing as, as prolia. Um, I like it a little bit better than zometa. Zometa to me is, is fine, um, but as you know, zometa is an infusion. Um, zometa you can't give to certain people with liver, or excuse me, with kidney problems, whereas prolia or denosumab, you've got a lot more latitude there. So that's what I was referring there to. Um, why 90 for liver tumors? Okay, another unresolved question is when should you be doing liver-directed therapy, which to John's question often will involve yttrium-90, versus a whole body approach like PRT? And boy, John, you're hitting a nail on the head because this is, I've heard this hotly debated as recently as last month uh, with pretty strong opinions on both sides. Here's my take. <clears throat> the organ that most of us need to protect is the liver, okay? Um, meaning that once our tumors metastasize to the liver, that is the organ that is then most likely to determine our life expectancy. I'm just speaking very bluntly. So you've got to be extremely thoughtful about how you're going to manage the liver. The beauty of Y90 is it has a much higher response rate. It's much more likely to shrink down tumors in the liver than PRT, and certainly way more than analog. All, all you can really expect from analog, unless you get very, very lucky, is stability. Analog is not designed to kill tumors. It's designed to stabilize tumors. And that, that actually is really important to understand right off the bat um, when you're prescribing sinostatin or lymeotide. If you don't tell your patient that and you're showing them stable scans months later, um, it's very easy to, to, for them to feel disappointed and you sold them a bill of goods. And so I am extremely clear with my patients in any setting to um, state from the outset my therapeutic intent, which again, unfortunately, is seldom to cure people I'd love to. I don't often have the ability to. Um, but if I can give them disease control and make their quality of life be better and make them live longer, then I'm, then I'm actually doing something, I, I think, for them. Regardless. So Y90 is, is fascinating. Um, I think we've come a long way in knowing how to do it just in the last five years. Uh, and as many of you know, the way it's done is, you know, the interventional radiologist will selectively engage um, an artery going to one side of the liver, and then the other, the beauty of the liver is it's bilobed and those lobes essentially act independently of one another. Um, they're also smart enough to know what's going on in the other one. So if you embolize the right side of the liver, the left side of the liver can compensate. The other beauty is the liver has a dual blood supply. It has the hepatic artery, which is typically what's feeding the neuro neuroendocrine tumors, and it has the portal vein, which is typically what's feeding normal liver. And so by embolizing the artery, you can selectively debulk the neuroendocrine tumors and leave normal liver alone. Here's the problem, John, is that the Y90 uh, is radiation. And so there's probably about a 5% rate of people developing cirrhosis of the liver five years out from their Y90 treatments because the radiation has done liver damage, which is, again, the last thing you want to be doing in someone whose liver is key to their survival. So 
uh, I hope that answers your question. It might be clear as mud. What, what I'm really getting at is if, if you're going on PRT, um, you're unlikely to see response in the liver or frankly anywhere else. PRT, if, if I know it's kind of a new shiny thing in terms of treatment, it is frankly uh, a little disappointing in its response rate. And I say that having read all the papers and, and seen all the data, I think patients assume or hope um, that it's gonna shrink everything. It only does that in about one in five patients, which is not a high rate. Um, again, not with Ludothera at least. And so I'm hopeful these other isotopes come along will be more effective. What is the relationship between the platelet count and the disease or the medications such as PRT that we use? Okay. Um, so platelets are important. Um, if you've had your spleen removed, or some of us have had, uh, you'll actually see your platelet count go up because uh, the spleen ordinarily takes platelets out of circulation. That's one of the things it's supposed to do. Um, PRT is interesting in regard to platelet count because like I said earlier, there is this very low but appreciable concern for bone marrow damage. So platelet count doesn't limit most people's access to PRT. I personally would probably feel comfortable I'm interested in PRT to someone even with a platelet count since say the 80s uh, or above, but all oncologists are a little bit different there. Um, somastatin analog has absolutely zero impact on blood counts. Um, Y90, interestingly enough, typically doesn't affect the blood counts because it's just going into the liver. Um, so I don't know if that's helping your question, Stanley, but I would say PRT is maybe the only treatment we've mentioned so far. CAP-10, which is a... Um, chemo pill combination, you definitely would have to be a little bit careful with the platelet count. Um, but again, where each oncologist draws the line and what they're comfortable with is, is a little bit variable and not that clear. Most studies will exclude patients with platelet counts uh, below 100, which is a little bit unfair because you can actually do brain surgery at that, at that platelet count. Um, certainly once you're getting down below 50, you're gonna see pretty easy bruising. And below 20, you might even have spontaneous bleeding. So that's kind of the parameters on platelets. Read blood labs. <clears throat> Do you feel there's value in looking at, at specialized tests as pancreastatin, serotonin, and chromogranin? Oh boy. Um, chromogranin is my least favorite tumor marker, <laughs> if I'm honest. Um, and again, I've seen people just drive themselves to distraction following its fluctuation. Uh, as many of you will know, the number one confounder of chromogranin is PPI use, proton pump inhibitors, drugs like omeprazole <clears throat> or Nexium, uh, which the Mayo Clinic has recently shown us. So if you measure your chromogranin level, the, the reference ranges are <clears throat> going to vary by lab, but most labs, the, the normal range will be something like zero to 100. At my institution, it's zero to 95, whatever. Taking a PPI, at least on my scale, raises that number on average 700 points. So I've seen people come in like in absolute tears. You know, they've, they've been to their primary care doctor, they've been diagnosed with carcinoid, they're on a PPI and their chromogranin is 800. And I'm like, well, hold on a second. Here's what we do. We take you off PPI for two weeks and then we recheck that. And I cannot tell you how many times that normalizes that number. So I, I'm really not a big fan of chromogranin. And in fact, the, the gentleman to whom we owe chromogranin uh, <clears throat> is a uh, brilliant um, Swedish professor called Kjell Oberg who have had the privilege of meeting. And he has basically at this point sort of disavowed the test. He's like, listen, it, <laughs> there, there's better tests. He actually is a believer in, that, in the net test from REN Labs, uh, which we'll touch on in a minute. Uh, but back to serotonin. Serotonin is an extremely tricky thing to track because what you have to realize is in your normal physiology, your serotonin goes up and down all day like the stock market. And so point testing of serotonin in the plasma or the blood is extremely prone again to fluctuating. And then I personally have an extremely difficult time um, interpreting it for my patients. I don't know if I measure them at a, at a high or at a low. So I'm actually a huge fan, even though I know it's inconvenient. I really like 24 hour urine 5 HIA because when you collect over 24 hours and you're looking at a breakdown product <clears throat> of serotonin, you actually get to sort of sum out the peaks and the troughs and you get to see where someone's living most of the time. So I find 5-HIA uh, much, much more useful than serotonin. The other thing is your 5-HIA level correlates to how likely you are to experience serious complications like carcinoid heart. So remember what's happening. Most people with carcinoid syndrome, not everyone, but most have liver metastasis. 
And that's a problem because the liver is ordinarily supposed to be filtering excess serotonin out of circulation. So now you've compromised that filter. Um, and so then straight from there, the blood's going from the liver to the heart. And so the, the right side of the heart is profoundly uh, vulnerable to excess serotonin. And if your urine 5-HIA level is above 55 milligrams over a 24-hour uh, interval, uh, then your right heart is in great jeopardy. And so those patients in particular, I'm pretty obsessed about getting the 5-HIA done. And, and Zermelo, which some of you may be on, is actually a great drug for doing that. So Zermelo works differently than any other treatment that we currently have in NETS. It's a first in class in how it works. It's called a tryptophan hydroxylase inhibitor. So it's a pill that some of you might take, typically three times a day. And it goes to the center, goes to the nucleus of the NET cells, and it prevents them from making excess serotonin in the first place, um, which is beautiful because you can almost immediately make the patient feel better if they're syndromic. You can protect the heart. There's emerging evidence. It may actually also slow down tumor growth. Because one weird thing is there's something called autocrine effect where the serotonin that comes out of the cells loops back around and stimulates that cell to grow. So um, I wouldn't oversell it. But I think there's probably about a I don't know, 6% rate of seeing disease control additionally when you add on Zerbello. <clears throat> so I know we're almost uh, done chatting. I don't use pancreas data in my practice. Gastrin is fine to check Stanley, but again, if you are on a PPI, you're going to drive up your gastrin level. So it's only reliable if you check it within two weeks of being off. And some patients can't um, tolerate being off. Um, let's see. Cream and prevalate. Huh. Prevalate. I don't, I'm not familiar with that one, Steve. That's a brand name. I must look that up. Um, News for cholesterol and LDL, huh? No, sorry, I, ha I haven't heard of that. I will say there's there's at least four different types of diarrhea that we need to think about in neuroendocrine tumors. So one, of course, is carcinoid syndrome, and analog and germella work best for that. There's um, bile salt diarrhea for those of us that have our, had our gallbladders removed. Uh, you're going to see the um, you're going to see the the bile going straight from the liver into the gut, and that can cause diarrhea, and that's best bound up with uh, bile acid sequestrants. Uh, like Questran or Clostyramine. Um, there's pancreatic insufficiency, as I mentioned earlier. If your pancreas isn't working well, you're going to get diarrhea and your stools are going to be extremely fatty. And that's best managed actually with Creon. And then finally, the tumors themselves, the pancreatic tumors can drive um, diarrhea with, with VIP lymph for instance. Um, and then finally, I'll, I'll circle back to the, oh, Clostyramine, yes. Clostyramine is, is, a, um, is a bile acid sequestrant. So what your doctor is trying to do there is bind up your bile and prevent the bile itself from, um, from becoming the, the source of diarrhea. So that, that actually is a, a fair strategy. Um, and then REN test, lastly. So full disclosure, I am actually a big fan of the REN test. Um, I think we're still learning how to use it. What the REN test does is it's a proprietary test from a lab at Yale run by Dr. Moodlin, who's sort of a giant of neuroendocrine tumors. Um, and what it looks at is the transcriptomic signature of neuroendocrine tumors in the bloodstream. And that's a mouthful. But what that means is how active are neuroendocrine tumors in the body in terms of the signals that they're making proteins. And that's what he's tested. Now, there's enormous debate about how to use it. Um, I think we're still learning it, but I, I guarantee you it is a lot more sensitive and a lot more specific uh, than um, chromogranin. Meaning that you can get a false positive chromogranin. It's extremely difficult to get a false positive net test. So I'll say that. Um, listen, I know I've blabbed on for a long time. I know we're probably needing to close. Are there any other questions I can address in the chat? I've got a couple of minutes here if, if I need to stay on longer. Uh, Dr. Lewis, I, I do want to thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, and uh, really interesting stuff. Uh, I was really fascinated by uh, Santa Staten and women. Uh, yes. <laughs> so, uh, but we really, really thank you. And um, for joining us, it was oh, yeah. very fascinating. Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, I'd love to meet you guys in person someday. Maybe, uh, <clears throat> maybe after the pandemic. Um, yeah. And I love your part of the country. I've not explored it enough. Um, okay, let me just see here. Uh, uh, lowest success rates of PRT. Oh, from a, from another Mark. I was confused there for a second. Sorry. Um, so, Mark, what I mean by that is you, you have to know what you're getting. Most of what PRT is going to do just like analog, is stabilized tumors. Only about one in five folks is actually going to um, 
see shrinkage of, of tumors. So here's the good news about PRT. You probably know this, the seminal study that got PRT in America via Ludothera was called Nature One. It was now published, gosh, is it four years ago? Anyway, what Nature One did was show that most uh, people that get PRT achieve stability, so they don't have growth. And the nice thing is the final analysis of Nature One isn't even done yet, meaning that we can um, surmise that most people must get years and years and years of disease control from PRT. So I wouldn't say it's a low success rate. I would say that it is unlikely to shrink uh, everyone's tumor. And if you go in the year and get shrinkage, I think many people will be disappointed. Um, I would not use the REN test yet to monitor uh, uh, children. I don't think that's a, um, a valid practice. Interestingly, for MEN1, we just updated the guidelines for children. And I'll say very briefly, as a, as a dad of uh, an MEN1 affected son, you gotta be really, really careful uh, how you test kids. Uh, and this goes back to radiation burden. It is a huge mistake to start throwing them in CT scanners when they're five years old, which has uh, until recently been the practice. Um, and, and there's also psychological burden to testing kids that we can't even either. So I, I'm, my own age threshold for testing kids with MEN1 has just risen from five to 10, like last month, having seen the new data. So let's see briefly on that. Um, point well taken, good. Uh, let's see, lastly, are you seeing that test instead of chromogranin? So Sarah Beth, buyer beware, the one uh, difficulty I think you might encounter is getting it paid for. So in my practice, and I think I'm not like um, trying to sound arrogant or anything, but I've got a personal relationship with Dr. Modlin, where so far he's been gracious enough to waive the cost of the test for my patients, but many insurances will not cover it. And so I think you just wanna have a, uh, a open conversation, open dialogue with your, with your doctor um, I think in your case, if I heard earlier, maybe I'm confusing people now, I, I would, before I do a net test, I would, I would certainly push for um, either a gallium or a copper dilutate PET CT. And then if doc's not willing to do it, then I'd find another oncologist. Um, there, there are resources you guys probably know online of um, uh, neuroendocrine experts. And someone asked me again, briefly, just to comment on neuroendocrine organizations, and I'll do that. And then I can go on as long as you want, but I, I realize you probably need to get one with your day and it's the afternoon where you are now. So um, I am involved in several organizations, as was mentioned at the top. Um, so Neuroendocrine Tumor Research Foundation is, uh, in my mind, the leading organization that is doing research <clears throat> and, and funding research. Um, and you should know it's, it's a phenomenal um, board of directors. Like I was, I was sitting down um, once at the board, this was of course pre-COVID, and the guy next to me was wearing a, a fleece that said TripAdvisor on it. And I said to him, I said, do you work for TripAdvisor? He goes, I'm the CEO of TripAdvisor. So it was pretty cool. Anyway, my point is there's these really smart people from business and industry who weigh in on how is the best way to spend research funding. And they, they vet these concepts at such a high level. I really think that that group of all groups is doing the best research or at least enabling the best research. Um, so that's, that's good. And then um, uh, I'm also involved in uh, the neuroendocrine um, excuse me, North American Neuroendocrine Tumor Society, which is more sort of doc facing, but they um, have uh, resources that I think are, are patient accessible too. And then finally, the um, Caring for Carcinoid Foundation, I think probably then most of all has a patient facing page where you can find by state, I believe, net experts. And I know that sounds like, again, being arrogant. Um, what they do actually is vet by volume. Um, so you've probably heard the um, Malcolm Gladwell theory of, you know, to be a master at something, you need 10,000 hours of practice. Same thing is true in medicine. The more you see a particular uh, patient type or tumor type, the better you're going to be at managing it. So they, they do a nice job, I think, of vetting by um, volume. Carol, I'm not sure what you mean by pills. Could you be more specific? So, so CalTEM is an oral chemo combination of a drug capecitabine and another drug temozolomide. Um, it, the sweet spot here is if your growth rate is between 20 and 55%, that's where it's been shown to work the best. Um, and it's actually a, a remarkable um, combination and it can work very, very well in some folks. One concern, this circles back to the platelets from earlier, is temozolomide is what's called an alkylator, which is a chemo class that can damage your bone marrow if taken for too long. So some people are really, really nervous um, maybe a bit too apprehensive, but I understand their concern about sequencing temozolomide and then PRT. In Australia, they had a study, <coughs> excuse me, 
where they did captain and PRT at the same time. And the rate of bone marrow damage did jump from three to 6%. So I would definitely not do that. Um, but uh, yeah, captem is for if your growth rate is above 20, but below 55, I think that's the sweet spot for captem. Right, Dr. Lewis, you know, we should probably let you go back and looks like you've got a bright, sunny day. <laughs> yes. yeah, I got to uh, get ready for Mother's Day tomorrow, but um, listen, this, is, this has been great. And um, oh, yeah, yeah. The, thank you for the Nanette's link there, Lisa. I really, um, Nanette's is fascinating because to be honest with you, they sometimes are a lot more focused on, on the doctors than they are on the patients. I still think the resources are, are great. And the thing I love so much about net groups like yours and why I'm so enthusiastic to speak to you, and I'm not just paying you lip service. I, and I tell other docs this all the time. I say net patients are the savviest patients in oncology. And I don't care if you say that to other, other groups because so many of us have to be our own best advocates, right? So it can take years for us to arrive at the right diagnosis. That was certainly my experience. You can be um, sort of burned by being you know, disbelieved by your by your doctors, and then and then frankly, um, because the field is moving so fast, which is a beautiful problem to have. Um, not every community oncologist or non-academic oncologist is reasonably expected to keep up, and so it is totally fine. The last thing I'll say, you if you're educating your oncologist about something, that's actually a wonderful thing. Okay, I realize for you it might be a little bit uh, off-putting. Um, and, and how they react to that, I think, is very telling because we've gone from paternalism, where we tell you what to do. We're now, I hope, we're in the era of shared decision making, where armed with the appropriate amount of information and knowledge of your own body, you get to make the call about what you want to do. And realize there's very, very few things in nets that are absolutely clear cut. And there is room for discussion and latitude. I, I think almost all of us start with analog in the first line. And I hope I've made a compelling case for land raid side. And then PRT is most people's go-to when you progress on analog, but that, even that is not absolutely set in stone. Um, and again, it's appropriate to have groups like this one where you share information. Um, and again, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And, um, uh, Aaron and um, Sally have my email. So if there's follow-up questions I can address by email, I'm happy to do that too. And wish you all the best of health. You guys are a great group. Okay. Thank you again. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Bye. Uh -huh. Bye. Uh -huh. Barry, 